So glad you're here. Thank you for joining me. I'm Julie Ballou, and this is Rape the Podcast. It's actually been since 2014 that Springfield police have been sending every single rape kit they've collected to a lab to be tested for DNA so they can log that shit into CODIS. They got a little bit ahead of the Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, which is a nationwide undertaking funded by the Bureau of Justice Assistance at the United States Department of Labor that began in 2015. This initiative helps state and local jurisdictions across the country inventory and test sexual assault forensic evidence kits, upload eligible DNA profiles into a national database, investigate and prosecute those cases in which offender DNA profiles match or hit against existing records in the database, and develop procedural and evidence tracking capacity to prevent future backlogs. As of December 2018, the Saki program had inventoried over 64,000 safe kits in 54 jurisdictions in 35 states. More than 47,000 safe kits have been tested, resulting in over 7,000 database hits. As the scale of the issues became apparent, the Missouri Attorney General's office began a preliminary review of the prevalence of untested safe kits across Missouri in November of 2017. The troubling findings of this review prompted the AGO to apply for and receive a Saki grant from the Bureau of Justice Assistance in 2018. And just about a month ago, they received another one. The Saki grant is great because it instigates a creation of a multi disciplinary working group. The processing of safe kits and the investigation and prosecution of the related sexual assault involves a multitude of stakeholders and practitioners. To ensure a holistic approach to Missouri's safe kits initiative, the AGO has formed a multidisciplinary working group, and that's made up of law enforcement, forensic laboratory staff, prosecutors, healthcare providers, and, of course, victim advocates. The most pressing issue facing the Safe Kits initiative is the backlog of untested Safe Kits across Missouri. The first major step of the initiative was conducting a detailed inventory of all organizations in Missouri that may possess Safe Kits. Backlog Safe Kits discovered by the inventory will be tested with the assistance of a contracted private DNA testing provider to prevent backlog kits from overwhelming the Missouri State Highway Patrol's crime lab processing of kits. As safe kits are tested, results that satisfy eligibility criteria will be uploaded to the Combined DNA Index System, otherwise known as CODIS. CODIS is a national database of DNA profiles from both known and unknown offenders and arrestees. As DNA profiles are uploaded, they are compared against existing records for matches or hits, which are used to connect cases and identify perpetrators. As safe kits from the inventory are tested, eligible results will be uploaded to CODIS for further investigation. Eligible cases handled as part of the Safe Kits initiative will also be entered into the Federal Bureau of Investigation's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program database. VICAP is a national repository for comprehensive case information for violent crimes such as homicides, sexual assaults, missing persons, and unidentified human remains. VICAP aids law enforcement in connecting cases across jurisdictional boundaries through offender behavior and related details in the case rather than just DNA. CODIS tits will be used to develop investigative leads that will be provided to the detectives of the local jurisdiction from which the safe kit originates. The AGO will provide investigatory and prosecutorial assistance to local jurisdictions as requested to ensure that offenders are brought to justice. To prevent a backlog of safe kits from developing in the future, the AGO will develop an evidence tracking system that will track safe kits from production through case adjudication as it moves from organizations through the process. From beginning to end, as it moves through the process, the evidence tracking system, which we're going to call ETS, will provide local jurisdictions a free tool for complete awareness of the status and location of relevant safe kits, as well as allowing victims of sexual assault to monitor the status of their kit throughout the process. 
So what was that called again? The Evidence Tracking System, otherwise known as ETS. That would be your friend if you have a rape kit because you can track that kit and find it and know what the status is, which is kind of a big deal. I don't know if we know exactly how many have actually been tested so far, but last month, September of 2020, we started getting some results. As labs work through a backlog of rape investigation kits, DNA matches could help authorities solve crimes. Color 10's Bailey Stroll is up first tonight. She spoke with Missouri's Attorney General. Bailey, tell us, what does this mean for assault victims in Springfield? Well, it's another step in finally identifying and hopefully one day charging suspects. These results are the first to be linked to offenders, all of them coming from Southwest Missouri. We're moving along in that process now. We can actually get to individual cases now from the test results that are coming back. Attorney General Eric Schmidt says this is the next stage of his office's Safe Kit Initiative, which aims to work through the state's backlog of 6,000 untested rape kits. And now we're entering a new phase where those test um, results come back. They're entered into CODIS, which is the National DNA Database, which will lead us then potentially to prosecutions. The process is beginning to come full circle. Late last year, the AG's office sent the first 50 of the state's untested kits to a private lab, those 50 coming from police departments in southwest Missouri. Of those, 16 were able to be ran through a federal DNA database, and of the 16, the state found 11 that matched offenders' DNA. And so that means that those 11 now are going to be referred to local law enforcement uh, as we work with the um, police departments, law enforcement, and prosecutors to potentially move forward um, with prosecution to make sure we're um, providing justice for the victim. Now that the State Highway Patrol Crime Lab has identified suspects, the investigation begins. It certainly gets much more uh, personalized, right? Because now we're talking about individ potential individual crimes. And that includes communication between police, hospital workers, and victim advocates. They're going to be really important as we move forward with potential prosecutions to talk to the victims whether or not they want to move forward again. And that's where our trauma-informed community is going to play a big role. How will these victims respond to learning the results of a rape kit that may have happened 10 years ago? It's more important than ever to be trauma informed. I went to Brandy Bartell from Springfield's The Victim Center to get more of an idea of what that's all about. I'm here with Brandy Bartell from The Victim Center. I really appreciate you coming out here and talking with us because you, your voice is very important to this conversation. And you were the one, I think we had a brief conversation of, over a year ago. I wanted to have a podcast. I wanted to call it accountable. I wanted to hold the police accountable for everything that had happened with the rape kit destruction. And then you said, Julie, there's, <laughs> it's not just the police. That's not the only reason that right. people don't report. Can you right. talk more about that? Yeah, I feel like part of my job is to educate our community broadly about the topic of trauma, of sexual assault, of course, in, in this particular case. A lot of the reasons why survivors do not come forward to report what happened to them has a lot to do with their sense of opportunity to feel supported and to get the help that they need. There is a lot of conversation right now at the social level. There's a lot of social dialogue, if you will, about the responsibilities of law enforcement. And I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about those things. I think it's always important to look at any of our systems and say, how can we improve these systems and make them more trauma informed? Mm -hmm. But People don't often talk about our own responsibilities in that effort as citizens because business leaders, other community leaders, individuals who vote, individuals who serve on juries, individuals who are educators, who are nurses, who are in the public eye and have an, a circle of influence of any kind, you could extend that to athletic programs and celebrities even, you could really look at any person in our community and say, all of us have the responsibility of 
understanding the dynamics of these types of concerns in our community, understand the impact it has on individuals and the community more broadly, and what role we can play in improving that for all persons. Because if a survivor shares their story, if they report it, they are committing to being vulnerable. And it's a very private, very traumatic thing for people to talk about in the first place. So if they take that very broad and brave step of saying, okay, I'm going to try to seek justice for myself or for other survivors who might come, you know, behind me, then they are putting themselves in a vulnerable position of ridicule, of not being believed, of being shamed, of perhaps not finding the justice they want, of committing time and resources to engaging in the criminal justice process because there's time off work. Perhaps they have children involved and they understand that they're making a decision for their whole family and not just themselves. And so I can see why a parent, for instance, who has experienced a traumatic event like a sexual assault might say, you know what, I don't want to put my kids through this public conversation that might happen as a result of reporting this. And so who is accountable for that? Is it law enforcement? Is it nurses? Is it victim advocates? Is it community leaders? Or is it more broadly each individual in our community who can create a culture of support, who can influence their own organizations that they're a part of, whether it be a school district or it be a business that has employees who might need support because of something they experience. Perhaps it's you're involved in a faith group or a civic group of some sort. And so these are things that we tend to think as a society that only Certain types of people need to think about this, need to deal with it. A lot of that responsibility tends to get put onto victim advocates and law enforcement and prosecutors. And of course, that's a role. I'm not saying we shouldn't play a big role in that conversation and that responsibility. But there's only so much that I as um, one individual, as one organization can do. And it is not something we can do alone or in isolation. We need the whole community to rally around the concept of support supporting survivors, of course, sexual assault survivors, but also domestic violence survivors and survivors of human trafficking. <laughs> and there are a lot of individuals in our community who come to the victim center and they say, you know what, I never thought that this would happen to me. And they are so traumatized. They are um, afraid. They don't know where to turn. They don't know who to ask for help because they're not sure who will believe them and support them. What that means then is that you have individuals making that decision not to come forward, which means that perpetrator will not be held accountable for what they did mm -hmm. for the choice that they made. And potentially they could reoffend. And that's always a concern when you're talking about issues around sexual violence or domestic violence, because we do know that Statistically, most of these offenders are people that garner the trust of the victim, and it's about power and control. Sexual assaults in particular do not happen just because two people were drinking. It happens because somebody made a choice to take away somebody else's power and control, and they felt like they had the right to hurt somebody else. And without a community in place that can say to inform a judge, if they sit on a jury, for instance, yes, we're going to hold an offender accountable for what they did, it really makes it hard for prosecutors to seek the justice that they are you know, passionately working toward. Because I tell you, most people in these types of fields do not go into these fields because it's because it's a job. They're doing it because they feel called in some way to help and to seek justice somehow for others. And so it's really discouraging to be in a field mm -hmm. and feel like the system isn't working in the way that you want it to. Do you feel like it's changing the system? I've been with the Victim Center for 16 years now, and I do see change. And I tell people that all the time, positive change, um, yeah. because I guess change could be negative as well. So 
I feel like there's more social discourse and conversation happening, particularly around the topic of sexual assault. And I think that's fantastic because what that does is it tells survivors, and that's why I love the Me Too movement, it tells survivors that they're not alone, that they have support behind them, that here are people and systems in place that can help you and support you. And so it helps to connect survivors to resources oftentimes. I feel like when people of influence leaders at any level in our community see that this is something the community cares about, they're going to pay more attention to it. Mm -hmm. It's not that it wasn't important. I, I don't think if you ask any community leader, it outright, is this an important issue? I don't think anybody would say no to that. But if it becomes such a big conversation point, and if it's more of the focal point, is what I'm trying to say, of social discourse, and it's done in a way that's supportive of survivors, it's done in a way that's constructive and positive without tearing people down, then that's where we start to see change happen at every level, at every you know, fabric of our society, mm -hmm. because those are people who will say, you know what, I feel brave enough to speak up and I feel like I have the support to speak up and say, this system needs improvement or this doesn't feel right to me. Maybe we need to change some practices that historically have been implemented. And now we're in the year 2020 and guess what? It doesn't make sense anymore. And so we need to fix it. Can you maybe give some examples of that? Recently, our state legislation passed the Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights, basically. And so I feel like even though for a while now our state has had within its constitution some crime victims, it was not as detailed and as specific to sexual assault survivors as it could have been. And so right away, like that's the most recent big thing that's happened at the state level, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's important for those things to happen at the state level is because my experience is pretty much rooted in Southwest Missouri and what we experience in Southwest Missouri. I have heard that other counties across the state don't always have the same resources or practices in place that we do in Southwest Missouri. And so potentially, depending on where you lived across the state, influences or shapes the experience that you have as a survivor and coming forward to report your crime. And so if there aren't as many resources or if the systems aren't in place to provide trauma-informed care, or if you don't have access to a sexual assault nurse examiner, then of course it's going to make the whole process that much harder and probably increase the likelihood that a survivor will say, you know what, this is too hard. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to move forward with reporting the crime or sharing my story. So I absolutely feel like it's an exciting thing to see at that state level leaders say, it's so important to us that we're going to outline some really specific standards that we would like to have all survivors have access to no matter where they live across the state. Yeah, it feels like we didn't know it was a problem until just recent, until the Me Too movement. And now leaders know it's a problem and we're doing something about it. Yeah, there's a lot of value that these social conversations have. It's one, it's to provide awareness, it's to provide education and information across society as a whole, which of course also includes people who make decisions at that state level. But again, going back to what I've, I've touched on earlier, it has to happen in a grassroots way. It has to happen more broadly for society as a whole to build up that momentum that you need to create change. Mm -hmm. And from my experience, you cannot have one organization or one entity solely responsible for change because that usually isn't how you create buy-in and create that change. And so I think the Me Too movement has a lot of agency in that work. And, and that's something that survivors should be really proud of. Yeah. I'm glad we're doing it. Yes. Would you mind defining, We I use the, the words victim and survivor interchangeably, but more or less, I feel like they're a victim right after it happens and maybe a survivor further down the road. Is that kind of how you look at it? I feel like that's really defined by the individual. Okay. 
So it's really not fair for me to say there's a definition. However, those of us who are in this victim services field will oftentimes use it in the way that you described. So we will often say a victim when a crime has immediately happened. However, it's really up to that individual person who experienced those things to decide Am I a survivor or a victim? Because what I've seen is that sometimes people who first report the crime, they will say, you know what? I'm not a victim. I don't like that term. That's a label that I do not want to own because that's part of perhaps keeping me down and and not allowing me to heal and rise above the pain and suffering that went hand in hand with that crime. Mm. But on the flip side, I have also heard people argue on the other end of that spectrum, healing from that trauma is a lifetime process. It is not something that will go away overnight, that trauma. There are so many things that trauma does to impact the well-being of survivors or, or victims, whichever word is appropriate for the circumstance. And so sometimes we will have people who say, I experienced trauma or abuse as a child and I'm an adult now, and I'm still working through the trauma that happened and that I experienced. And so that word survivor may not necessarily fit where they're at in life. And they Mm -hmm. may not feel like they've survived anything because they're still living it every single day. So I think we struggle as a society with finding the right terms to talk about these things. And that's one reason why it's so hard to provide that awareness and education and information to the public, because if survivors and and experts, if you will, struggle with talking about using the right words to talk about it, how much more so would it be for those who aren't necessarily working with this every single day yeah, in, their, in their day-to-day work? And so I understand there's questions around these definitions and terms, and it's a hard... I don't think I gave you a direct answer. <laughs> no, I, I get that. it. <laughs> what about the terms sexual assault versus rape? How do we define those? Just from a, if you're looking at the law, so rape is a type of sexual assault. And so rape is typically referred to a very specific type of sexual act where consent was not a part of the sexual interaction, right? So basically sexual assault more broad is a more broad term as a whole and, and can refer to things like digital penetration. It could refer to objects being used sexually inappropriately. It could refer to touching over the clothes. It could refer to sodomy. It could refer to a lot of things that sometimes when you when people use the term rape, survivors or victims will hear that and they'll think, oh, that doesn't describe my experience that I had. So I must not have been victimized. Hmm. And so we have to be really careful, I think, as a whole, because oftentimes survivors don't recognize that what happened to them was a sexual assault or that what happened to them was a rape. And oftentimes that's something in particular that we have to work with children and teens because they will often feel like this, my experience doesn't exactly mirror what I'm hearing other people talk about. So I must not have been a victim. And so it must have been okay what happened to me. And so what we try to tell people in general, if somebody touched you or hurt you or did something to you without your consent, that is not okay. And if it specifically centers around a sexual contact or activity, that is a crime. For children, what we often teach kids is that you have the right to say no, you have the right to give consent or take away consent. You can change your mind. What is consent? We focus on the topic of consent. And then what happens if you didn't give consent or if something happened that made you uncomfortable, who do you go to? And so we have to talk about safe adults with kids because not every adult is a safe adult. And oftentimes kids will report a crime and that adult that was supposed to be a safe person in their life will say, uh, please keep this a secret or, or don't tell anybody. And so unfortunately, what we often say to kids in particular is tell somebody until somebody believes you. Mm-hmm and tell an adult, safe adult, until somebody believes you. So it's really sad, unfortunately, that those are messages that we encourage parents to teach their kids in the home. We teach safe adults like teachers and nurses and other caring individuals in our community to learn 
learn how to talk about these things because if kids aren't taught from an early age about consent, then it's going to be so much harder when something does happen for them to understand that what happened was wrong, to have the language to talk about and describe it, and then where to turn to get the help that they need because kids cannot, and, and adults shouldn't either, but certainly no person should have to go through that experience on their own. Yeah. And there's certain disenfranchised communities. I spoke with a woman of color the other day who said that black families do not talk to the police. They do not tell anybody what happens in their house. Mm -hmm. they, that's the way they were raised. Mm -hmm. What might be a safe parent, well-meaning parent, may get reported to CPS or something if they do end up telling and losing. It, it, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong there. How do you deal with confidentiality at the victim center? Everything that we do at the Victim Center is bound under the rules of confidentiality. So what that means is for adults, they can tell us anything they want and we cannot and will not share that information with anybody else. Not a friend, not a parent, not the court system, not law enforcement. Now there are some exceptions. So if we get a subpoena from a court system that says turn over all your records, we as an organization do everything we can to try and quash those through a legal process under that rule of confidentiality. But there's always a risk that a judge would say, you have to turn that over. I don't think I've ever had that experience at the victim center. So that's the good news. That is good. We always just have to be very clear and transparent and allow victims have to inform consent about yeah. what they want to share and not share. And that's, those are their decisions to make. With children, going back to your question about confidentiality, we're mandated reporters by law. Mandated. And so yeah. if somebody says, I know of a child or if a child calls us and discloses a crime, we're going to have to report that to the entities involved in investigating those types of crimes. Do you continue to work then with that victim and those agencies that you're reporting to? Do you stay involved in that story? Um, if I understand your question correctly, the process that happens after we report a crime against a child is that usually it goes to Children's Division first and Children's Division will open an investigation. Sometimes law enforcement will also be involved. Sometimes law enforcement gets involved first. It just depends. But both entities jointly work together to investigate. Oftentimes, a child advocacy center will be involved, and so child advocacy centers are fantastic, and we work really closely with our local okay. child advocacy center because it's a child-friendly, child-focused facility that is very trained in how you interview children who have experienced a potential trauma or witness something, and then they have medical examiners on staff, and usually that have very specialized training in what to look for in child abuse. And again, it's a trauma-informed model, and it's fantastic. So the Child Advocacy Center will typically, if they're involved, will do the interview and in, in medical examination. Not always. Sometimes hospital systems or pediatricians are involved as well. And then what happens from there is really up to the state and what evidence they're able to collect, what information the child has been able to share. And it's really hard with children because depending on how old the child is, they may or may not have the words and language they need to describe what happened to them yet. Mm -hmm. But I'm so glad that there are agencies like Child Advocacy Centers out there and very highly trained detectives that know what other evidence they can rely on beyond the child's testimony that will help to build the information they need to take a case to, to trial. And so the Child Advocacy Center, what they do is they refer that child to the victim center for counseling, follow-up support if they need that. Usually we're working very closely with the non-offending parent or guardian of that child. Sometimes the prosecutor's office will decide to go to court and to press move forward with charges. And sometimes the prosecuting attorney's office decides they can't do that because there may not be enough evidence available to move forward. And it's a very traumatic experience for an adult, let alone a child to go through. And it is not a speedy process. It will take years typically. It is very understandable that 
children going through that process will need a lot of support. So yes, so the Victim Center will provide mental health counseling to the kiddos, non-offending parents, provide support, do court prep with the families. What I mean by prep is, is not necessarily, we don't talk about the individual aspects of their case and then tell them what to <laughs> to say. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we teach children the number one rule of going to court is to talk and tell the truth. And here's the rights that you have when you go to court. And we have a kids court program where we take kids who are having to testify in the courtroom after hours to the courthouse building and they get to meet a judge and a bailiff who aren't involved in the case at all. They get to see the facilities. They get to sit on the truth telling chair, which uh, of course is the witness stand and practice just speaking into a microphone because that's a skill set that a lot of kids don't yeah. have yet. Answering basic questions, what color is your shirt? Red, you know, or green or whatever. Don't nod your head. You have to say yes or no. So there's some basic skills and rules of court that most people don't know going into it, let alone a child. And we're there to support that family. That, that sounds process. really helpful. I'm glad to hear that. I would imagine that this process is pretty difficult for the advocates that you work with and for yourself. Sure. What yeah. makes a good advocate? I think the pat answer that a lot of people will say is a good advocate is somebody that has a caring and compassionate heart is wanting to help those who are hurting, have been impacted by crime. But I obviously there has to also be some professional skill sets that go into being a good advocate. You need somebody who is trained, who has an organization system behind them that has a lot of resources that has expertise and longevity to support those individuals doing this work. So if you had a chaotic working environment, that would certainly not support the advocates doing the work um, in the field, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You need policies and procedures in place. You need funding. You need some job stability. There's a lot of things that go into creating resilient employees and victim advocates. And we also have volunteer advocates. So this, I said employees, but you can yeah, apply that both. same thing to yeah. volunteers as well. It isn't as simple as just having the passion, although certainly that's a huge component. You have to have that motivational fit um, of, of being a good advocate, but you also need to have the support and infrastructure and organizational stability behind those individuals in order to set them up to do a good job. It seems like you might have to develop a thicker skin. No. You want to make it thinner? No. It's not about having a hard skin. It's about having the soft skills, the coping skills, the resilient skills to be able to deal with it. We're human. It doesn't mean that we have thicker skin or that we are somehow like magically immune to these types of stories and hearing the, the human suffering that goes on every single day. Rather, what do you do with that information that you're hearing? How do you process that? What support do you have to work through that? Again, it's about resiliency. It doesn't have anything to do with being a hard or, or soft person because mm -hmm. you can have people that put up their walls and they're going to be less resilient potentially than people who are open to their experiences and understand its impact on them and they know how to process and what to do with it to help them be able to continue helping other people. For sure. That makes sense. You've mentioned trauma informed and I wanted to ask you this huge question to answer. <laughs> what does trauma informed mean? I've, yeah. I, I understand that's a really big picture and what yes. I've been amazed at, I don't know why it didn't occur to me that it could help in so many other areas besides just yeah sexual yeah. assault. Can you give me the five minute version of it? Yes. yes. <laughs> I will do my best. Okay. First of all, trauma informed is, is a technical term that should be used to describe a system or an organization sometimes that is informed on how trauma impacts individuals and every aspect of policies to decisions, to the paint color on the wall, or to how an environment is set up should center around that understanding of trauma. And so it informs everything you do. So if you had a janitor on staff, they would understand how their job or how their role in a system or an infrastructure or organization impacts individuals who 
have been traumatized or experienced trauma in their past. If you have an accountant, they would understand how the work that they do could have an impact, positive or negative, on individuals who have experienced trauma. And so you're probably thinking, what do those two types of roles, which are periphery, maybe in an institution or a system, have anything to do with trauma? An accountant is making policies or practices, and they decide to cut a certain line item in the budget that is central to creating a, a supportive environment that is healing and safe for survivors, then you can see how cutting the wrong thing from a budget yeah. um, could dramatically impact the effectiveness of a system or an organization in helping people who have experienced trauma. If you have a janitor who doesn't keep the facility clean and it's not a safe facility that survivors feel or victims feel comfortable uh -huh. <laughs> going into, then you can understand how their role is important. Mm -hmm. And trauma-informed is is used very loosely. I've, I've seen people throw it around a lot because it really is a gold standard and it is something that even victim service organizations like the Victim Center are always working toward. It is, I don't think we'll ever totally accomplish that goal of getting there because there are always a lack of resources that prohibit our ability to do everything 100%. There are always going to be, like for instance, I at this point in time don't have a staff that 100% represents the demographic makeup of Southwest Missouri. I wish we did and it's something I'm constantly working toward and how we recruit and train staff, but that's just something that we have to understand that individuals who make up our organization have their own experiences. How do our individual experiences inform what we do unintentionally, right? And so maybe if you have a survivor that has some disabilities perhaps and need some additional supports to access services, but I don't have anybody on staff or on our volunteer force who necessarily could identify personally with that person. There's always the potential that our organization will not fully meet the needs of that person. It's something that we work hard to be aware of and to be sensitive to and to respond to. There's always work in progress there, and I, I wish it was perfect all the time, but that's probably something unattainable for for every circumstance. But if you're working towards it, you're working towards it. Right, so and I think that's, that's the better most than not. <laughs> that's the most that you can ask, like every single entity and system is, we understand that the gold standard, that perfection, that pursuit of perfection is going to be a work in progress and it's going to take time to get there. Um, and we're doing better, I feel like, as a society through some of the things we talked about earlier about the state's recent survi Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. We're doing a better job, I think, slowly to try and be aware of trauma and how it impacts our society and what we can do as a society to be aware about it, to respond to it, to be sensitive to it. But that ultimate goal is to be trauma informed. And a lot of places haven't even started that conversation. And so that's really the broader concern is to what degree are they even identifying that these are issues that are important that we need to acknowledge and address so that we can move forward. Yeah. I feel like what I'm learning from all of this, all of my experience here is that there's so many cogs and each yes. cog is super important and it has to be trauma informed, no matter whether you're just on the outside looking in or if you accidentally make it on the inside, you've got to know how to deal with the situations because it could happen at any minute. Your daughter could come to you and tell you that she's been raped or your son and you have to know how you're going to react and think about it maybe beforehand. Don't you think? Yeah. So many people just don't even think about what would I say? What would I do if somebody I know came to me and shared this with me, whether it be a child or a, a sibling or a f close friend, a colleague? I always tell people it's so much simpler than it than people make it out to be. First of all, believe them. That's central to any type of response because it takes a tremendous amount of courage and bravery and vulnerability for somebody to share that and to open themselves up to you. And so if they make that very brave step, 
my goodness, <laughs> the least that you can do to honor their story is to say, I'm so sorry that happened to you and to believe them because they're taking on a great deal of vulnerability and risk even by opening themselves up in that way. And, and so, I feel like you should almost be honored to feel oh, it important is, enough to be relied yes. on for that. I still feel every single time um, that somebody shares their story with me, it's a very humbling experience yeah. because it does require a great deal of trust. And then in some ways, what do you do with that information? Do you just say, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Okay, let's never talk about it again. And that happens. And that happens. Or do we say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. How can I support you? Yeah. What can we do together to get through this? And if it's an employer or an HR manager, their way to support a survivor or, or a victim might be to give them extra time off or some time to use flexibly in their day. Or it might mean creating a safe working environment for them. Or if it's a faith leader, it might mean helping them understand how spirituality fits into their healing journey and how that's a huge, important aspect of healing for a lot of people or that it's not okay. <laughs> First of all, I think sometimes we fail to acknowledge that or to say that out loud to survivors. It's not your fault. That's exactly right. This should never have happened. Mm -hmm. It is not your fault. This was not okay. I think people in general just get really paralyzed by feeling like they have to do all these things perfectly. But I feel like those are some pretty basic responses that any person is capable of doing without needing specialized training. Agreed. Now, what about this knowing your rights? I, I know my rights. You can't do that. But victims have rights. And sure. I received some information that looks like all of those small print that you have to go through when you purchase a new something and you have to sign that you've acknowledged you read all this stuff and it's yes. just too much to read. So you don't. And I feel that way about the victim's rights. Is there any way to condense that down? Oh, goodness. <laughs> I think the best thing to do and given our time limitations is to say, yeah. make people aware of the fact that they do have rights, that there are rights, crime victims' rights built into the Constitution of Missouri, which is pretty amazing. Most recently, there was at the state level a Bill of Rights for sexual assault survivors that was passed. And so the bottom line is that law enforcement, nurses, prosecutors, defense attorneys, victim advocates are all now charged with helping survivors or victims understand what those rights are. And so I always encourage people to reach out to a victim advocate. I know sometimes people feel like they don't need it. And so reaching out for help is not a sign of weakness. It is not a sign that you are less of a strong person than, than somebody else. I feel like it takes a great amount of strength and it is a sign of strength to reach out and access all the resources available to you. And I'm the, just the type of person, this is just how I'm wired, that I want all of the resources that I can have because why wouldn't I want to set myself up for success? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like having an advocate in your corner, so to speak, will just help to make the process feel a little bit less cumbersome. It will help to provide information, connect you to go to the right place. Let's be honest, this, the system is the criminal justice system, the civil justice system, because those are not the same things and they often happen concurrently. Those are overwhelming processes. And unless you're in the field and have worked in the field for a really long time, it's going to be overwhelming to navigate it. And so why wouldn't you know, a survivor want that help. Now I know the really good reasons why people don't want help and that's okay. That really is every person, individual person's decision. But when you're talking about rights, like you said, it's several pages long at this point in time. Mm -hmm. And right now, even in our community, law enforcement and prosecutors and victim advocates are talking about how do we even go about sharing all of this information with somebody, for instance, that's in the hospital. They might have injuries. They might be struggling with some mental health issues, perhaps. They're traumatized. Oh, my goodness. How would anybody begin to retain all of this information all at once? Is it even appropriate to do that given some of the circumstances that might um, be there. And so we're just, we're trying to figure that out ourselves, the best way to provide that information. Of course, it, we'll give it to them in writing, but it's 
Again, it's like the, okay, yeah, whatever. Yeah, but you just don't want to show the piece of paper at somebody and and be like, oh, here's a sign that you got this. Just like when most of us go to the doctor's office and we have this like long HIPAA consent to treat form. Who reads that? Nobody. Nobody does. You just sign it and move on. So we're just struggling with that, trying to find that balance of making sure that survivors feel supported, have access to knowing what their rights are, but then on the flip side doing it in the right way that's sensitive and again trauma informed yeah what are victim compensation didn't know anything about this until recently myself there's i feel like the general population doesn't know about victim compensation how would you describe that yeah so crime victims compensation is a state-run program that has the ability to compensate its reimbursement based typically, um, not always, but oftentimes. And it will reimburse victims for certain types of costs that they incur as a result of the crime. So medical expenses, mental health counseling, funeral expenses, I think even sometimes lost wages, although I I can't, don't quote me on that because there's a lot of rules on what Mm -hmm. they will and will not fund in certain circumstances, parameters, but it is an application process. You don't just get this money, by the way. And so that is a process that we have advocates on staff trained to help victims go through if they would like that. Usually it involves gathering receipts, filling out a piece of paper, turning it into the state, the state reviews it, they turn it back into the victim. And so in the meantime, they might have hospitals trying to collect money from them or a funeral home trying to collect money from them. And it's a very stressful experience for survivors. We do have clients that benefit from that all the time. So I don't want to discourage anybody at all from applying for it because it is a blessing to those who can get it. Mm -hmm. But I also don't want to give false hope to people that they can just walk in our doors, for instance, and we hand them a check. It is not something that straightforward. Got to jump through some hoops. There's a lot of hoops there. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything you feel like the sexual assault task force may have missed or are there more areas that we can improve on? The challenge with the task force or the city of Springfield anyway is that the city of Springfield can only do so much. It has its jurisdiction, if you will. So the city of Springfield is not in the position to tell the state what to do or to tell the judicial system what to do. (laughs) And so I think it's just important for people to remember that when we were going through the very arduous like process of trying to narrow down what the priority should be, it was like, how do you possibly narrow down everything? And then also some understanding that we had to keep it within the framework of what the city itself is capable of, capable of influencing and responsible for. At some point, and I can't remember if it was at the beginning or at the end of the report, there were some just general acknowledgments that this is just the first step. And I think it's an important first step. And there were a lot of great recommendations in there. And so it doesn't mean that this is like the end all be all. It does not mean that once we accomplish all these things and we're done. Yeah. <laughs> this is a continuum. You have to start somewhere. And how do you do it in a way that you're identifying what's realistic, what's feasible, and what are your priorities? It's so hard sometimes just to collectively decide on that. Yeah, <laughs> um, for sure. Anyway, it was a big deal, I think, for the city to dedicate and allocate the resources to just commission that work to be done. And I'm really hopeful that over time, once we get through COVID, Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that our community can, again, renew some of the momentum behind that report. I'm just so proud of everything that our city has done and and that we're taking the initiative. So that's what I just want to share with the world is that it is possible. And if it's not happening in your community, then it could. There's still time. Yes, (laughs) absolutely. And I don't think I don't think there's a quick fix for a lot of the issues, mm-hmm. but the, the gaps, the fixes in the system. Can't make a law and correct a whole bunch of this. Stuff. I, I wish I could, if I were queen for the day, I'd fix a lot of things overnight. But the reality in our world is that it's a journey. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. I know that feels pretty trite, but it, it very much applies to this work. And we all collectively need to 
take a step back and say, what role can I play in this good work? How can I be a part of this change? And every person can do something, even if it is as simple as becoming aware, informing our friends and our circle of influence, and then being very careful about our social discourse, the language that we use, what we choose to support, how we vote. All of those things are opportunities we have to create the change we like to see. And so when people hide their head in the sand, whether intentionally or not, because sometimes I think people just aren't aware of what they don't know, that really isn't going to move the needle forward in creating a safer, better, more thriving community for all persons. These issues have a ripple effect on every aspect of our community. So trauma impacts our educational rates of graduation and success and testing scores. It impacts our workforce development because so many of the clients that we serve at the Victim Center are not able to return to the workforce or work at all. So if we can provide the healing supportive environment that they need to be able to return to work if they want, that would be wonderful. There's a workforce gap in our community right now, and I don't think we're unique. It's so important that we look at this from an economic standpoint. It impacts our health system. So many of the major health concerns that we have as a society nationally, you look at health concerns like heart disease and substance abuse, and you look at anxiety and depression and suicide, all of those things are tied to risk factors or impacts of trauma. So how amazing would it be if we could really make a, and to move the needle on those health issues yeah. in the positive direction. Yeah. If you look at our criminal justice system, I think people complain about how overburdened it is. And I know we're not focused on offenders um, right now, but I, I would just argue that we need a to be lot eventually of the offenders yeah. have experienced their own trauma as a child yeah. or otherwise. And so if we recognize that offenders need treatment and um, intervention as well so that they don't reoffend and can be a, a more whole person. That's a huge component of moving the needle. So anyway, I, I could up. go on and on, but <laughs> I, I really, what I'm trying to say is that every person is impacted by this issue and everybody knows somebody who has been impacted by these issues. You may not be aware of somebody and what role can each of us in terms of accountability play in finding the solutions and the change we would like to see. In the next episode, I'm going to talk about youth, about race, and about history. Please feel free to review and rate this podcast and share it with anyone you think might could benefit from the information that I give out here, even if that means sharing it with your city leaders. And please, these stories can be hard to hear if you have been a victim of sexual assault. There's help out there, and it's just as simple as picking up your phone and calling 1-800-656-HOPE. Thank you for joining me. I'm Julie Ballou. And this is Rape the Podcast. <laughs>